Everyone can hear me? Any, any tech problem? Okay. Um, I can hear me. That's great. So this session is going to be about an introduction to open SCAD. So what, what am I going to cover? Well, first I'm going to cover the introduction. I'm going to tell about what this presentation is trying to do, a little what it's not trying to do, um, the scope, goals, and then the answer. And then a quick, in this introduction to open SCAD, before delving into the uh, real fast, real deep into a whole lot of details. So, open SCAD, let me explain, right? No, there is too much. <laughs> Let me sum up. So that is the goal of this presentation. It's not a tutorial, slow, step-by-step, -step, do this, click here, drag there. No, it's going to be to give you enough of a feel for the product, the feel for some of the usage, and maybe help you get excited about trying it so that when you go to look for it, you can check the references, get the info, get going, and know which things to look for under the menus. I'm, I'm sure most of you are able to at least pull down menus and look for a command if you need to, or use Google, look for the help. Okay. So, it's, as I'm going to be summing this up. I'm going to cover the first half or so, depending if I go quick enough or not, is going to be like swamp of the basic to give you a deep, heavy immersion, just boom, into it. And then from there, a little more of the references. So the, fir the first half, if you feel lost, don't, that's, that's not bad. It's, that's the thing where you go online, read the manual, read the, there's a quick reference and a few other things to, to get caught up. But you'll at least have, hopefully, some clue of what was going on. So getting ready? Are we all ready to dive into this storm of information? <laughs> okay, 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 that's better. So goals. First goal, it's an initial push, just to get you, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you've seen people use it, maybe someone just saw it on the schedule. This is the, hey, go, this is, this is handy. It's great for a few different things. I've used it for several different purposes in the last year or so, so, so that's good. Um, I want to inspire you to use it and do stuff and maybe stretch a little out of your uh, comfort zone, see what you can and can't do. And present you maybe with some sources to, con to continue on with. You know, one or two I'm going to drill in a few times, so if you at least remember those, you Google, you'll, you'll, you'll get close, and then you'll be able to continue without being blocked. And that's a big goal. And then, before we go, and, first of all, I did mention the answer. Is it the, to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything? No, no, no. It's the answer to my title, and profit. Because some people might be in here, I want to be frank, upfront, this is not a no, uh, you know, money printing machine. If you learn SCAD, you're not going to get rich in 30 days. There, there is, it can be a tool to help you, it can help you get along, so there are avenues for revenue, but first and foremost, I want you to just use it and get, get the hang for it and, and have fun, that's the first thing. Have fun, then see what follows. And then, uh, real quick, Little aside for myself, just in case people don't know me, which probably most don't, I work on Inkscape. I have for years, 2D vector graphic thing. Uh, way back in the day, <laughs> before I committed to full-time programming, I used to, when I was still consulting, I did some programming, some art, did multimedia stuff for game companies, did a 3D dungeon for one of the larger game publishers, modeling and animation uh, in the days before Max was called Max, <laughs> and um, one time I came into the offices and saw they had laid out work lights matching up to the layout of my imaginary dungeon, and it was like seeing something I created in my mind in the physical world, just even the lighting like that was just a great inspiration to me, and, and, and it turned a lot of things fun, so you know, maybe you'll be able to use this to get that same level of fun as you get going. So, now moving on, quick introduction to Open SCAD. First thing, the maintainers are very clear about this, answered one of my very first questions. How do you pronounce it? Not Open SCAD. The maintainers prefer Open SCAD so it doesn't sound like an open wound. And so I can go with that. Um, what Open SCAD does, it takes code like this and creates actual 3D things you can print out into the real world. 
like this. Real quick, when you bring up OpenSCAD, the interface might look something like this if you open a file. On the left, there's a code editor. On the right, there's a customizer I'll mention later. In the middle, top, 3D view, that I find the top two most important. Below it, output, including debug and errors. So that, those two, important. So if you bring it up, personally, I say hide the, the left and right pane, hide the editor, hide the customizer, just use this and alt tab or whatever, switch back and forth to your preferred code editor of whatever form. Although the editor in here is functional and will get you going, if you're comfortable with something else, I, I, I prefer to switch in and out. So that was an introduction of OpenSCAD. <laughs> now, but that wasn't very much. That, that was just a little. So time to take a closer look. <laughs> so let's see some more about OpenSCAD. One of the things, compare it to a few other tools. These are just the top couple that show up often when you do a search. If you want to find more, search for more. If you enter in a few of these together in any search, you'll probably find others, and certain people will have things jump out. But th these are some of the top competitors, or, or, or top ones to be out there for you. FreeCAD, it's, functionally, it's very similar to OpenSCAD, but it's all GUI and traditional CAD layout. But it's parameterized, so you can go back and change all the values later and have it updated on the fly. That's what I love about OpenSCAD, because it is code. You just change your variable, and boom, everything's magic, if you use variables, not constants. Blender, that's the name in open source 3D. If you're not familiar with Blender, look it up. They're doing a conference in LA, and OK. But that can be used for a few different use cases. It's big in um, movies and television nowadays also, in, in addition to everything else. Tinkercad, easy to start, web-based, designed for 3D printing and students and classrooms. And so if you just want to do something real, real quick, doodle around, use a 3D printer, that, that's OK. SketchUp, that's the big thing, but it's more architectural focused. Some people really like it, too. Fusion 360 is really nice. High-level CAD actually does all sorts of stuff for you, but it's not free. If I want to use it on anything non-free, I'd have to pay the, I don't know, 500 a year or something like that. So for a CAD product, it's not that expensive. For a free hobbyist, it's very common. But personally, me being trying to focus on free and open and open source, I, I, I avoid that a little. So when is OpenSCAD a good choice? Here's a quick example I had. When you're making parts, components, designing something, uh, replacement parts for something, creating cases for things, non-organic, really good for that. Parametric, so that you can parameterize to change your values as you go to adjust to the specific instance. That's, that's very handy. And then, you know, like this guy here, I, I could do this. I did not do this. This is an artist. I could do this in OpenSCAD. It would probably take me about three or four times longer than any competent artist, but yeah, that, that's still doable. When is OpenSCAD not as strong? Organic things, freehand art, sculpting, like this beautiful piece here. I, I really love it. Uh, simulation and analysis for some of the more engineering-minded stuff. It doesn't do that. So that's kind of the uses, but what is it? It's, it's basically, in essence, a coding language with a GUI to edit it and preview it. And, but you can also do it completely command line parameterized to compile, and your output is going to be a 3D shape file, as opposed to you know, a hello world or whatever. And now, there are some key concepts about OpenSCAD. When you go, first go to look at it, you, know, you might go for the um, use the force. <laughs> you know, just go with it. No, no, do not do that. <laughs> your feelings, guesses probably are going to be wrong unless, oh, how many people here used to use POV ray or have or still do? One, two, yeah. If you've used POV ray, this will be so familiar. You just have to learn this specific dialect. If not, yeah, it's going to be different. They have the quick reference, the cheat sheet. Everything's grouped into groups. I know you can't read this up here. When you go home, look it up. Everything's grouped categorized, easy to format, easy to find, you know, no, no, get an idea of what you want. Once you start to look at it, this is like the second most common thing I have up. So how does OpenSCAD work? It's constructive solid geometry. Core, that's at the core. 
how many people know what that means? One or two, okay. So what you do is you take primitives, you take geometry, you take the things and you build them up. You add or subtract, you say, here it is. And you can go, that operates in 2D and 3D and there's stuff, transitions to convert between the two depending on how you are gonna need things. And there are also many ways to get similar results. So in essence, you take a shape, like a, a big pyramid or cube or whatever, and oh yeah, OpenSCAD can render stuff solid or wireframe if you'd like. Whatever, and you can switch back and forth and you can do solid with wireframes and all this. And so, um, but when you go to start working on it, you know what? I'm not left-handed. There we go. So, so what you do is you define a shape like a cube or something like that and you just cut it apart, but not with a sword. You use operations of another shape, another cube, another sphere, or another to say, add this to or cut this away from what you have already. So, moving on. One of the big concepts is the concept of module. So naming, it's just a function. Any other language is a function, is a subroutine, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I actually like this because what do we have up here? The command module, the lunar lander module, that's what you're doing. You're making independent pieces that can be joined or separate or whatever in what you're doing. Maybe a foot, maybe something else. So that's what you're going to think of. Then they have functions that return a value. And this is, could be a single number, could be a text, you know, line of text, could be an array in a complex, in a complex item would be an array, which could have arrays of arrays, or, you know, I mean, you can get crazy there and whatever you put into it. And then I just put out the recent versions added the let function. So function, whatever name equals let, and inside the parentheses you define locals just for that function. And there's a reason why that's a, a good way to do it when you see how the language is structured. And then other than the 2D primitives, you have 3D, you have the Boolean operations, which is subtract, add, or intersection, generally, and various transformations that can do all sorts of things for you. Move, rotate, skew, size, uh, multi-matrix, and Murkowski, which is fun. Next thing, moving into the what, land of the declarative tree. So this is the core to understanding how OpenSCAD works. And this, this took me a little bit to figure out when I got going. What you want to do is think of it, it's a tree of things, although like most computer trees, you go the other way, you start at the roots and you build up the node, combine, 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 combine until you get your final result at the end. And it's declarative. It's not you don't store a value, check a value, store a value, you know, wrong kind of function. You say, here is this. There it is. So you're building this tree out and not just sequencing function calls. Uh, how many people program in Lisp here? I think I got two to admit it. Yeah, so you know, sometimes you have to switch the way of your thinking, but once you realize that is the case here, then it all becomes much easier. So that's why I like to think about the word when I'm working on it, emit. So you're going to, as you're working through the code, it's emitting what you're doing. Boom. That's it. Code done. You're not interacting, storing values, changing values, similar to um, XSL style sheets, uh, make build systems. Who here is a GNU make expert? Just me? Yeah, I know. Uh, and um, it, the thing is, it's declarative. You say, it's a thing, not, not command. Do this, do this, add this, subtract this. Not so much. And that kind of leads on to the trick about variables in OpenSCAD. So you don't get tripped up. They're not variable. If you set a value and down later you set the value again, the first, everything that used it uses the last value you set. So the last value wins. <laughs> so only set it once, except when you go into a different scope, inside of a module, inside of a function or something like that, then you can a set, declare a new value for that variable, overrides the previous value, but stays around within that scope and things it calls. So you might accidentally set something and call a function that calls, or call, invoke a module that invokes a module that calls a function that has a module that accidentally uses one of the values you changed and everything breaks. 
So remember, it's from that point in the tree down that it's going to change. And then of, of the variables, the naming, standard programming naming, except for the ones that start with a dollar sign. Those are magic. I mean, they're reserved, and a few of them are used for special purposes. And there are some that you care about. Dollar $FA, dollar $FS, and dollar $FN. And I'll explain that later. <laughs> dollar T, another one I'll explain later. But then moving on a little more quickly, let's see. Yeah, we're, we're still doing OK. So here we have the details of the language. A little more information, a little more important. Now that, now that you've got Swamp, with just hopefully the idea that, yeah, it's a little different from the languages I usually use. So slowing down a little to cover a little more of the detail now. Control and lists. So you have the primitives I mentioned, you, you, but then you can do things. You can set one or more variables in a for loop. And then the, the syntax for a for loop is interesting. You can have it for start from start to end. You can set, put a step in between. Otherwise, it defaults, I think, to one normally. And, or you could just do a comma separated list of a whole bunch of values. If they're not calculatable, you can just, oh, just some random loop, 5, 17, 21, whatever. And it will all work. Um, although, if you're doing the start, stop, end, the rounding might not end where you ex expect it to end. So sometimes if you only have a couple, I'll either just list them with commas or I'll add a 0.01 to the final number so that it gets included. Check for that because that could be tricky. And who here uh, codes in Python? Anyone? Okay, a lot of people, almost half at least will admit it. So if you're familiar with Python, you might know about list comprehensions, similar kind of aspects to that. What I declared there in the for loop I showed you before, they're, I mean, they're magic. I love them. So far in all the languages I've seen them, mostly Python, you know, it, it does a wonderful job and you do whatever you want. Although here in OpenSCAD, I consider that an advanced topic. Once you start to get the hang of it, look in the details in the manual and, and fine tune your expertise. But know that it's very similar. Know that's what they're called and know that you need to try to see. If, if not, you can just use the for loop examples like I had there. <laughs> so that will get you started. Now, primitives. You're building up constructive solid geometry, CSG, combines primitives. What are they? In the set of 2D primitives, we have circle, square, polygon, which is your, OK, it's, it's not simple, let me give you the individual points. Here it is, boom. So it, that's the freehand one, whatever. Text, and then import, where you can import a DXF or an SVG. And SVGs can be very handy. So the, let, me, let me put on my Inkscape hat for a minute. <laughs> so um, you can bring it into OpenSCAD and do things with them. And like this logo right here, I brought it in, cleaned it up in Inkscape, brought it in OpenSCAD, printed it out a couple different times, different sizes, meshes, you know, really handy. But that's a whole nother talk in and of itself. So hopefully we'll have another one following up. And then projection, that just is the keyword to take your 3D things and turn it into a 2D object. I, I really haven't used that much. I haven't had that much need for it yet. But if you do need to go from some 3D down to a 2D representation of something, look up projection. Now we have 3D primitive. Sphere, cube, cylinder, polyhedron. Polyhedron is like polygon, but you specify the points and the faces. So if you really love coding 3D shapes by hand, which unfortunately I do, you can use that. <laughs> Linear extrude, which, um, let me grab my little guy here. One way you could make this, you show, you, I could take a, well, cubes are not all one-sided. It's actually a rectangular solid. So width, height, and depth is how you specify them. I could take two cubes and chop one off the other to get this triangular uh, prism. Another way is I could take the triangle itself and just extrude it. There you go. Now you have same thing, different ways to get the same results. And then rotate extrude is kind of similar, except it's instead of pulling out straight, it will spin in a circle, or a partial circle if you want. So depending on what shapes you're trying to come up with, like if you're trying to do a vase, you just do the points for the outline and then say rotate extrude, boom, you've got a beautiful vase, or an eyeball, or whatever. And 
there's some parameters that can tweak it, especially like linear extrude, you can make it shrink as it goes up or grow, you can twist it as it goes up, you can scale it, there's a lot of interesting things, but if you start with the concept of extruding, and then I think like the, the manual mentions that's like a Play-Doh extruder pushing stuff out, whereas rotate extrude is like a potter's wheel. Oh, it's okay, I have, I have some other interesting ideas, but that will get you going. Now some of these, the primitives might not look like they have enough for you to go with. So what we want to do is look at what's missing and there's some secrets from how they're solving, what problem they're solving and how they're solving it. And then there's a little few hidden secrets inside the shape types themselves. So secrets, we like secrets. <laughs> Let's see what we have there. Oh. Remember I told you circle and cylinder were primitives? They're not, they don't exist. <laughs> Rather, they, th these are the keywords in the language, but you're not actually producing those. They're actually regular polygons, ingons. So it's just a, an arbitrary number of straight lines connected to simulate a circle or a cylinder. So, and even though I think uh, some of the common formats for exporting do take circulars and other stuff, that's not how this operates. It's by creating polygons. And anyone who's done a game that ends up eventually into something that can be tessellated into triangles. Yeah, there are no round things. You know that. And then when they're doing these approximations, you have the, uh, some of those magic variables I mentioned earlier. Also, the trick is when you're doing uh, one of these polygon drawing to a circle and it's approximating it with straight lines. The straight lines are inside of the ideal circle. So that might trip you up later if you didn't know it. And then uh, there's this very, I fig one of the first things I figured out, there's a very simple magic formula so I could figure out how to specify a size to get a polygon to be outside of the circle. If I'm trying to make a hole for something to fit in, it's got to be the size I say, not smaller. Or it could be a little bigger, but not smaller. So that's the key there. So these magic variables I mentioned, uh, the first two, they're in, calculated from each other. So $fs is the minimum size of a facet or an edge. So when you're circling it, how big do those have to be? You don't want that to be too small because those the smaller it is, the more shapes you're gonna have, the longer it's gonna replicate, especially when you have a whole bunch of things to, to render. And, produce. Dollar FA, minimum angle for facets. I'm trying to remember what they, word they use. I'm using facets here. They, that means if I'm going to do a specific angle for things to be done, so that I don't care about the size, maybe I'm having a, a smaller one and a bigger one and I want to make sure they match up, you know, you can do that. Or dollar FN just says make this many of those. So that lets you specify how many you're going to do. And that's where you get the primitives for pentagon, triangle, even square. It's a, it's a circle with an Fn of four is a square. Circle with an Fn of three is a triangle. And so that, okay, there, there's a lot of my missing shapes. And if you set dollar $fn, by the way, two things. Remember, it's going to override those other, the defaults, so you might get weird effects. And if you set it in your, as you're thinking of your tree from top single root all the way down, as you call each module, and that module invokes a module, if you change Fn, it'll stay changed until you change it again. So be careful. And then here, for people, okay, I mentioned the magic. I have to let you see the numbers. Don't worry about the picture so much. This is just for illustration, but showing you that here, I have a red circle is what I've specified, and then the polygon is inside of it, so its corners are touching. But if I use this math, suddenly the, the edges are outside and touching, and the corners are way outside, and that's the green circle there I've got set up on the outside. So very simple. I mean, look at that math. What, divide by cosine, okay, <laughs> that's not hard. So, and, and by the way, the trig functions are in there, those, so you don't have to write your own, it's all built in, so all the handy stuff. And we'll get in some details about the math on that in a bit. 
Next is the secret life of cylinders. So first of all, there are no cylinders, right? That's one secret you now know. They're, they're regular edged polygons extruded into a pr um, prism of whatever number of sides. But not only are they that, they're also cones. So you can, now this one I did not do a graphic on because I don't want legal issues. <laughs> you can either pick, you can do radius or diameter for your cylinder or circle, or you can, for a cylinder, R1D1 or R2D2. <laughs> what that is is the R1 or D1 will give you your first radius or your first diameter, and then the R2 or D2 will give you the radius or diameter on the other end of the cylinder. You've got a truncated cone. You've got a trumpet. You've got a lot of interesting things going on there. Just remember, pick either R1 or D1. Don't have both of those. But, and if you have a, one of them with one, have one of them with two, and you might have to switch the sizes because maybe you put your big one first and it needs to be second or whatever, depending on your lines. So that's an, another interesting thing you can do with cones. It, so it's in the basics, it's built in, it's a basic thing in the language, take advantage of it. <sighs> Breathe. <laughs> Next topic, <laughs> Boolean operations. These are what you do, and, and you, when you're writing the code, you write this like a function. Notice this is not a tutorial, so I didn't put the code up here, but it is so easy to find, so I just want to be clear again. So union puts two shapes into one. You can, you can also do curly braces to group them together for other operations, but then whatever's outside is performed on each one independently. If you're doing a few complex things or setting colors or other stuff, that might make a little difference. Difference cuts the second one out of the first. So, and if it's a complex shape, it'll do something else. And intersection, only the overlap between the, the two things, first thing and second thing. Now, Boolean operations, like I mentioned before, work in 2D and 3D. Also, union, pretty dang fast. Difference and intersection, really slow down depending on the complexity of what you have. Because think about the, if you have a really complex spaceship and you want to cut out the path of a meteor going through it, how many different shapes is it going to have to check for intersection and all that? So one of the tricks here is to try to, if you're going to do Boolean operations that are simple and in some 2D before you extrude or rotate, do it in the 2D land, it'll be a lot faster. I've not been able to, in basic tests I had, I was not able to measure a difference between union and um, difference in 2D land. 3D is like exponential, all crazy. <laughs> so some, some of these operations are coded really efficiently. And then the other thing is, ooh, math is your friend, new, new section. So who here loves math? Oh, a quarter maybe, was a third, then suddenly a quarter, because they thought about it and said, oh yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I, I can do math, I don't love it. Okay, here, math is your friend. Do the simple math, makes it easy, makes it work, make it, make it be your helper here. Don't be afraid of it. And if you need to, do some web searches, find what you need. So when we're looking at the math involved in OpenSCAD, a couple of things very, very important. First, the trig functions operate in degrees, not radians. So if I want a whole circle, it's 360, not six point. You know. If I want half a circle, it's not pi. You know. But if you need to use pi, it's already defined for you, so you don't even need to define it. Although like half the time I do, <laughs> just out of habit. And then the other thing is that rotation starts on the right and goes counterclockwise. So depending on the, if you coded different 3D engines and or four different 3D engines in the past, this might come up. That, you know, is it left hand or right hand rule? What that means is if I put out my right hand, close it and curl my fingers into a fist with my thumb pointing out, thumb is pointing away from the page, my fingers are curling in the way that things will turn. So that, uh, my, my wife will walk through me and see me, I'm coding something and suddenly I'm just, I look like I'm hitchhiking. I'm just like, okay, what, what way do I need to rotate? Okay. 
And then the other helpful thing for, especially if you're not as comfortable with math, need more practice with math, you know, that, that's what I'll call it. I won't, I won't say anything else because, you know, don't self-sabotage. Because math, you can see, is a lot easier. If you put in a number in your 2D or 3D and you see your thing jump to the left when you want it to jump to the right, oh, I need to make that negative or positive instead of positive or negative. I need to, flip, you know, easy to see. Also, you can write, now, I mentioned the transforms, so the, the transformations you can do on them. Go and look them up on the reference, and they're on the cheat sheet, but they are like translate, which moves in the position. Rotate, which spins around the origin. Um, those are a couple. So if you, you can put those all together, but sometimes when you rotate in all three axes at once in the 3D space, it might do what you want, but it might do the exact opposite and flip completely wrong. But if you had rotate, rotate, rotate as three separate commands with three different values in there, then you'll be up with only one X, Y, or Z being rotated around at a time. Much easier to control, much easier to see. And then I mentioned one thing. You move to center, rotate, because all rotations go around the center. So if you have something over here and you want to make a turn, well, what you do is you move it to the center, then you rotate it, then you move it back. Really simple, but by the way, there's a secret there. When you're doing this move, rotate, move type of doing things, you're, you, you do it over and over for each thing, can make it really easy to function. You're working with polar coordinates, advanced mathematics, and it's trivial when you're doing it like that. Sometimes, you know, so I'll either move over, rotate, move, or I might do the, okay, x times cosine 45 plus y times co Sometimes I'll do that. That's the other way to get things where you need to go. But you do what you want. And then, ooh, what is the matrix? So who, who here knows matrix math? Who likes matrix math? Okay, a couple know it. One or two maybe like it. If you like it, you can use it. In the dot operations, all this standard stuff, if you understand it. Um, for me, and the keyword is use multi matrix. So if you're trying to apply a 2D array that isn't a uh, matrix, that's the keyword that will do it for you. You can build them up so that they add together, but I usually don't do this because it, it doesn't work for my brain as well. I mean, I've written simple 3D engines a few times, so. When I'm back in it, I can get up to speed and produce you know, matrix stuff, no question. And I understand it all. Three months later, it's, it's, it's not in my head anymore. So if your brain works like this, good, it's in there. If not, you don't have to use it. You don't even have to know it's there. And see, moving on, good. Now we're up to some of the, some of the more Interesting things you may not get from doing searches to try to get started in right offhand. But the one thing I found really up quick is animation for debugging. How many people use animation for debugging already? Ooh, two, good, good. So for the rest of you, animation in OpenSCAD is very simple. There's a variable. Oh, look, that other magic number I told, or magic variable I said you might care about. This goes from zero to either almost one or one, depending, and there might be bugs, and some people have issues, so. But when I'm using it for debugging, I don't really worry about that final precision. And it's based on how many, if you say, I want 18 frames per second, it'll go from zero to one in 18 or 17 or 19 steps, give or take, but roughly. If you want, if you go four frames per second in the GUI, then you'll get 0, 0.25, 0.5, 0 0.75. Other, other times you might get 1.0 added at the end, depending on the math and the rounding and all sorts of other stuff. So you set that in the GUI and it starts animating. You can save that in a sequence of files to put into a GIF or something else or put as a video online. But if we're debugging, we're not doing that. So when might you use animation to debug? Test motion. 
I had, let's see, I have a couple parts here, which could turn and move if I disconnect things without breaking them. Yay. Just, I have a piece that spins. Yay. But it's got corners. If it gets too close to the wrong thing, it will hit and collide and won't, in the physical world, I won't be able to make it move. Well, if I take my two pieces at the top level and put them on an intersection and animate, then only, it, I'll only see something on screen when they overlap. Of course, that also means when you're doing animation to debug something, you might have to bump up the frames per second or number of steps to get enough steps through there so that you can see it so you don't just skip right by it. So that's, that's handy and in fact when I was working on some of this set of things that came up because I printed one set of things, put it on, tried to turn it, <laughs> snapped. Oops. Oh yeah, I'm like two millimeters off on one of the corners. Uh, throw it, put, start animating, throw it in an uh, intersection, boom, there it is. Yep. Fix my numbers, boom, it's fixed, now I can print. Um, ooh, to test via sliding slicers. This is an interesting thing, is that if you, remember, intersection shows you two shapes, so if you take a box and just move it across your final thing back and forth, it'll do an x-ray that cuts through different areas as you go. That, I, the first time I did that, when I was trying to do a rotating maker coin piece, it was just like, oh, with built-in bearings, print and plays, oh yeah, it saved so much time once I started doing that. So you, you have a cube, you translate it by something, either X, Y, or Z, or both, or all, whatever, multiplied by dollar T, so it goes from zero to one, it will go zoom across. And then another thing is to test parameters. What I mean by parameters is just Oh yeah, probably have to call those out separately. It, you, you, it's, a, it's a coding language, you have variables. Any one of your variables could be a parameter. Like you have wheel diameter, that could be a parameter. So if you check if your code works on small wheels and big wheels and you want to write generic reusable code that can work on both, if you animate it like 100 times dollar $t plus two, so you don't get a divide by zero anywhere, then suddenly you see that, yeah, when your wheels get over 10, everything else breaks. You know, so you can use it to animate your variables, your parameters, your, your settings. But here's something from my multimedia days. Linear animation is jerky. If you go to animate something, it's going to be yep, yep, start and then stop. Whereas if you, first trick I do, you know, I use trick. Either multiply cosine or sine, it just means a start at zero or start at half or negative one, depending on what you do. Then it will speed up and then slow down. Then go back and it looks a lot more natural. And the reason I say that is important when you're debugging is it's not just for aesthetics. What that really helps for is your brain. The human brain is just and especially the visual processing centers. So amazing, it will catch all sorts of things if it's in the realm of what it's expecting to see. So if you do a more natural you know, start and get speed and then slow down, because nobody moves full speed zero, full speed zero, your brain will catch things a lot easier. And then you can tweak with, with all sorts of other tricky parameters like that. So that's just like, yeah, so it's not just for cartoonists. Programmers can use animation in their programming jobs. There, now you've got that. Oh, going to print. <laughs> These things break. <laughs> if you do something wrong, but that's okay. So first, when you go to print, you're gonna need to use a slicer. And what that does is it takes your print, it takes your 3D shape that you've coded and saved and exported it as some format, STL is the most common. You bring it in, slicer. Slices it for your printer or your friend's print. Okay, for, oh, I should have checked this sooner. How many people here have a 3D printer? Mm, a 
quarter. Okay. How many know somebody who has one? Okay, about a half. So, so either you or your friend's printer, who's going to be now your best friend, because you know how to do things, but you don't have one of these in your kitchen, um, you're going to slice it and send them the sliced thing for that's sliced for that printer. And what it does is it, it converts it into commands to do layers, set the temperature, movement rates, all sorts of things. Uh, first step in moving to the real world and use something that lets you preview the output. Because there's so, majority of the time when I code something new, pin it in the slicer, preview it, slide up and down to look at my, make my layers disappear. It's like, oh, wait, that's wrong. <laughs> Go back, try it again. Go back, try it again. A lot quicker than taking 20 minutes to print a little piece and realizing then that you did it the wrong way. So even if you're not 3D printing, if you're using OpenSCAD, getting a slicer to run things through so you get the feel for what's going on is really handy. And of these, I see a few of the, the most common ones out there, Ultimate, Ultimaker Cura, Prusa Slicer, those are both free. Simplify 3D is commercial. Uh, a lot of people really like it. Uh, slicer is what Prusa Slicer was forked off of at one point. And then there's Octoprint. Has anyone ever heard of Octoprint? Okay, so you can run Octoprint on your server on a system to control your 3D printer. So instead of having to put your print on a SD card, walk over to your printer in the other room, plug it in, copy it off, hit the menu, hit the wrong button, go back, try it again, get it started and go, then walk out of the room, then have to come back and stand in the room until it's done. Octoprint lets you do that over a nice pretty web interface and it runs on a Raspberry Pi. So you can you know, plug, put one right next to your printer, plug it in, stay in your bedroom, watch it through a webcam, all that great. It will also, you can send it the full STL 3D files and let it do all those slicing for you. But if it guesses wrong, what's going to happen? You get a bad print. So that's why I said maybe. And then now, as we're moving in a little more, printing for FDM. Does anyone know what FDM means? I believe it's fused deposited materials. What that is, is how the most common 3D printers you have out there, the plastic ones, they melt plastic and lay down layers over and over, fused. So that's what that, that's what that is, as opposed to resin-based or light or heat or some, there are many other fancier, more expensive ways of 3D printing. Uh, you can get a really decent entry-level 3D FDM printer for, you know, around $200, a little less if you catch one on sale. Um, now, there's a couple tricks. One, because of how they layer things up, well, first of all, visual aid. This is what your 3D printers normally are doing. They're putting out a whole bunch of rows of extruded plastic on each other. Hopefully, you've gotten them straight. Maybe they're not so they won't be as strong there. Also, if you're thinking about this, if I'm sticking these, stacking these directly up on each other, that'll work. If I tried to put them next to each other in the air, they're gonna fall. So you can either print with supports or at most a 45 degree overhang most printers can run through. So, and you also want to align for length, so, or strength. And then, you know, so here is my simulated 3D printer. And this is actually how they really, almost, almost exactly how they work. So the printhead just extrudes out plastic more and more. And you're going to get, now in this case, because this is worn, I got a really twisty thing. So one of the things here is, is this going to fit with my other straight lines? No. And the reason I did this one separate so I could beat up this poor guy like this, this will happen if your nozzle gets slightly clogged. You'll get weird prints. You'll get less printed out, so it's not going to hold together. So keep an eye on it. 
But be aware of that. And as you're going, align for strength. So if you have these, and then if you remember my illustration for applying force, is if I take this, I can bang away pretty much that direction, that direction, really good. But if I come this way, it'll split right off hand. So depending on how the forces are gonna shear it, you're gonna to want to keep in mind. So maybe you print something straight up and down, maybe you print it sideways. You, if, you're really, if you've got something really weird and you want to average the strength, you don't want stronger in one direction than another, you print it at a 45 degree angle. So everyone is slightly compromised, but not completely. Um, oh, also, you're, you're in, even if you're paying $1,000 or more for a good printer, it may or may not print out exactly how you expect it. Different plastic filaments might be slightly off. We're talking 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters maybe, but when you do a whole bunch of layers all together and a lot of really fine control, that can break. That can give you a problem. So you allow for it, and also you measure it, and then, like I said, each, not only can each plastic, you reel the plastic you buy from a different manufacturer, print differently and slightly thicker, slightly thinner, slightly stronger, slightly weaker. If you leave it laying around and it gets too hum too, takes up too much humidity, it absorbs enough moisture, it might print differently. So over time, you might get different results out of the same roll of plastic. So allow for some wiggle room, and if not, measure, see what you can do. Printer calibration is part of that process, we'll do it. But if you just allow for, I'm gonna print this, my printer, I give it a 0.1, any edge I'm gonna print, I give it a 0.1 millimeter extra. And when I measure the thing after I print, it, it gets to where I want. So if I, if I tried to, I gave it a number, I want the physical thing to match the number, no. I give it a number, I want to subtract 0.1 so that that number is smaller, so the physical thing is the actual number, I, the size I want. So allow for that. And I use a variable, so in case something goes really wrong or some plastic is really different and I'm, I'm not getting the result I want, I can just change that variable at the top of my program and all the rest works. And then there's one other thing um, called if you search for problems, you might find this weird phrase, elephant foot. <laughs> That's where at, it's printing pretty good for most of it, but at the very bottom where it started on the plate, it's a little bit wider than its normal extra. So you can really get down with a micrometer and tune it and do this and that, or, I mean, if you per plastic every day, or, you can be like me and be lazy and say, well, no, instead, let me just make all my designs so that they have a slight taper at the bottom so it looks pretty. And it, it won't bump up against the piece next to it. There, <laughs> they fit, you're good. And then a few more hits, hints. So this is for people taking notes and there'll be more later. Also, if you go and download this probably tomorrow, all the bonus features will be at the end of the presentation as extra slides where I'm throwing in all sorts of these detailed numbers, which you don't care about sitting here now, but two months from now when you're trying to do this, you, you'll care about them. So I found that when you do one of those little clip, you're gonna make two parts join together. You do a clip, you know, pump, pl standard plastic snap together kind of thing. If you make it twice as wide at the or twice as thick at the base, it gets even distribution of its stress. If you have it thick all the way through, you're printing too much plastic and it's not as strong as it could be. Also, if the corner at where it hooks on is sharp, more stress, it's gonna break. If you, if you round that in, in what they call a fillet, then it will be smoother. And if you're printing one of those snap fit pieces that you want to move and hold together afterwards, it's you want that rounded diameter to be half the width of the, the thickness of your clip part, whatever that is. And then um, support ribs and gussets, which are, well, raised pieces connecting either two pieces or just to the floor, that would be a gusset. Connect between two pieces would be ribs, basically. Make the, you can make those thinner, 60% thinner than your main walls, and they'll still do a good job. And then 
here's the thing. If you want to find this type of number and everything else, I'll dig up, a, I found two different PDFs of like research papers published by a couple big companies because for injection molding. So when you're going to print thousands of thousands of things, you want to have it engineered correctly because casting a metal die is really expensive. Putting the plastic in it and taking it out, that's cheap. So they have some good research so that you don't do the wrong thing up front. And then you can collect whatever you're doing that's pertinent to what you want, some note, maybe just a text file somewhere or something. Just collect up the tidbits as you hit across them because you might be looking at something else and suddenly you realize, oh, I might be able to use this. Let me, let me make a note of this so I remember. So those are handy. But for those of you who actually do manage to at some point code something, even just a cube, because you know, that's a good hello world, because then you can measure how your printer performance and see if it's all wobbly or not. But as soon as you go to print your first thing, it might go wrong. <laughs> so what do you do? Isn't this beautiful? You can see, I'm not sure if you can see, these round pieces I have are kind of turned into springs because they didn't hold together. Uh, the other thing, that's supposed to be a penguin, that big old pile of spaghetti. I got up. I went out when it was supposed to be done. I watched it for like a, the first quarter of the print, and it was perfect. Came back after it was supposed to be done, pff, spaghetti. Oh, that's, it. That's, 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 that's what happened. That is my penguin. Just It didn't quite connect. So there could be, OK, what happened? Like the dark circle thing. Oh, that's a penny for scale, by the way. The dark circle things that turned into springs. I've had this happen before on two, from two different sources, hardware failure. One, there's a little spring arm that holds the plastic against the roller wheel as it pushes in. My spring arm was plastic and broke. So it stopped holding enough tension. So I got that weird undo extrusion springy shape. Um, could be I designed it wrong. Maybe I, oh, wait a minute, I'm trying to print a tiny little chair with spindles that are only one millimeter diameter. No wonder it can't get those straight. Let me make it a little thicker. You know. um, orientation. Oh, I'm printing a chair with a whole bunch of tall, thin spindles that have to do a whole bunch of teeny tiny circles on top of each other to make it work. What if I just lay it on its back? Oh, now those are just one big long, one straight solid, one straight solid extruded piece of plastic. Okay, this will hold up. A whole bunch of little tiny circles won't, won't hold up nearly as well. Uh, lack of supports. Maybe you tried to print an overhang that was too overhangy and you, most slicers will add supports. So they'll print little temporary pieces under it so that when it comes time to do that piece, there's something there for it to print above and then you can break those off afterwards. And then lack of adhesion. That's, and, okay, these, this is just a quick summary of some of the most common failures and their names so you know to look it up. That's just when maybe I was printing something like, oh, that's what happened to the penguin. I was printing the penguin, he was going fine, then about a quarter of the way up, his feet didn't stay still on his bottom didn't say stuck to the print plate. So instead of the print head moving around the penguin, it started just moving the penguin around the print plate and psh, yeah. So in my case, the only thing I needed to do was get an Elmer's glue stick and just go psh, real quick before I do a print. Perfect adhesion. If that was the problem, if it wasn't that my nozzle got clogged or a physical part broke or, you know. So check to see which reason because they can all cause you similar things. And then from here, trying to do a little bit of wind up. A couple places, Yegi, 3D search engine, finds the thing. Thingiverse, that's where people share mostly creative common license of one form or another things. You can download and print, edit, remix, and they have the customizer thing. So you can go on the website for the customizer shapes, flip parameters in the GUI, say give me this STL, and they'll give you the STL ready to print. So you don't even have to download the open SCAD file. It'll do it for you on their web server. Only on for old, older versions, not the most latest release. Then, you know, there might be more specific places depending on your use case and your need. And if you're trying to sell, you know, you know there's a lot out there. So tell me which ones you guys end up liking. Um, and then money. 
Ooh, yeah. Might be able to get it some. So sometimes you can make money making physical pieces and selling the printed thing. You either print for someone or print a design. Um, you could sell the model. You can create a 3D model and sell that. Like, um, I think the Wolf model I showed earlier, that one is like $3. If I want to go online, just buy that one model. Then I can print it as many times as I want. It's like, oh, okay. that's not for me. That's not too much. I can afford that. You know? Or you might design custom parts for somebody or something or some project. And that's a good way to, oh, you know, I could 3D print something that will make that work and then we can, then we can ship the product or project if it's something else. And then just printing for others. Sometimes some people will get a 3D printer and say, hey, no, you'll be competing against some other actual companies doing this, but you can say, hey, I have a printer. Pay me five bucks, I'll print that thing out for you. Send it to you in the mail. You know, so those will get you started. Just Those aren't the only ways to make money from this. However, personally, I think having fun is the most important thing because you can write code and get the thing in your hand. So then that's, that's, that's probably the first step. If you're having fun, then you can continue to make money. If you're not having fun anymore, go do something else. And you have control because you're doing it. It's your code. You can write it. And you can also collaborate, talk to others, put your shape up, ask people to give you feedback to help you. And hopefully that will help you get going, at least know where to look to get started. So do we have any questions? Um, if I want to get help from more advanced users on how to do things in open SCAD, where should I go? Good question. I need to look up. Depends which kind of users you're looking at. I am just starting out in the community. Um, the, maintain, the maintainer now is in Europe mainly. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm more thinking about, you know, how do I make this yeah. shape, hmm. not I found a bug. Yeah, no, 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 he, he, he actually knows some good shapes and is supporting usage of it, but there is, um, there are, Thingiverse has some, a lot of message boards, and also um, the other first place to look is Reddit. There's actually a really good, there's not only 3D printing, there's Open SCAD, and there's even Ender 3, which is my printer. Very good active communities on Reddit. Uh, the one other thing I'll mention uh, for both for people who don't have a printer and for people who are looking to make money with their printers, there's a site called Print-A-Thing, which is super cheap 3D printing because it's a network of people trying to make money with their printers. Mm. Print-A-Thing. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Well, thank you very much. Oh, there, very well, there's one more right behind you. What are you most excited about in the field? What, I mean, like, give us a snapshot of the day. Oh, what am I most excited about in the field? That's a very good question because I've been watching this since, uh, definitely since I first, specifically since I first went to speak at Linux Cough Australia, I think in 2005, where I had my talk in the top talk top of a hall I was talking on color management and down in the bottom half yeah okay good and in the bottom half Vic Oliver was doing his clarinet playing robots I was like how can I compete but he was doing rep rap showing all the things but it had always been hobbyist level up until about a year or two ago and then suddenly like the Ender 3 you know there was another one a mini my friends got you know it's got like a print plate about that big that, you know, 200, two something for a 3D printer wasn't bad. Then the Ender 3 came out and it's got a, was it 220 millimeter by 220 millimeter print bed? And that, I don't want anything bigger because it would take me too long to print something that much larger. So, but the precision on it, so to me, they finally hit the point where it was when inkjet printers hit the home use price. And I'm just waiting for it to explode from that. How about the material? Where, what's happening with the material? Oh, 
How about the material? That's a good question. Uh, most common for the plastic extruding printers is PLA, which is organic base and should break down over time. And there's a lot of, you can get custom ones with rubber, with um, carbon fiber, metallic. You can do conductive ones, so you can 3D print circuits in the middle of your other prints. Uh, bronze is, I'm not sure. No, you can get bronze look. You can also get some plastic filaments that include metallic parts in them. You can get plastic filaments with wood combined. So you can do wood-like prints that you can sand, stain, paint, and stain. Why do you already paying so much to get the bronze that you can get to do something that you can just do? Yeah. And then one, one other thing other than bronze printing in bronze is if, you're, if you really want to go to the next level, turns out PLA melts at the perfect temperature, so you could 3D print a complex shape and then cast your metal into it. Oh, that's what you're making the mold. That's the cost of money. Yeah, so if you want to do the one-off, you print, put it in the sand or whatever it is, you pour the molten metal, metal replaces all your plastic, boom. And what about capture? I don't know very much about where you capture. Oh. Do you capture like a 3D object? Yeah, how do you capture a 3D object? Um, there are several ways. I 3D printed a bed, for, so I can do that. I haven't done that yet. That's, that's going to be next, that's going to be summer's talk. There, there's several different ways to do this, and, and some of my coworkers at, at my day job have done it already, so we'll see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, and then... I promise toy surprises. I have a bunch of, uh, printed a bunch of my little maker coins in different color combinations here. So you can come up and grab one of the little things just to see what the prints are like and what you can do with OpenSCAD. No, OpenSCAD, sorry. <laughs>